welcome to the Fired Up with CJ show. I'm here with Lauren Carey, and we're talking about a book, My Year with Nana, at the end of her century. And um, at the end of the second segment, um, we were talking about power, um, the gaining and losing of power, and um, I think also ways of addressing power imbalances. Right? And, we, and you know, when do you speak up and say something? And when don't you? And and when I think back at my own life, you know, because I my my parents are immigrants, and so I had a lot. And I lived in the East Coast, being the only Asian girl amongst all white families, pretty much. And there are so many um, instances of bullying and name calling, and 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 as you said, like a collective sense of rage that kind of get it, you store inside of you, and. I guess, that, and as I've been actually negotiating my own um, voice and deciding when to speak up, when not to speak up, what's considered an infraction and what's considered a crime? You know, like when do I really? Mm-hmm. And and you know, there's all this different way. There's individual speaking up. So here you've written this book, which is your individual. Like this is my voice, and I'm speaking up. And then there's the collective and you, you were talking about the um, burial site, which was for black people only, you know, or, or, or for mostly dedicated to black. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I have, you know, equivalent of the, an, an Asian version of all of these things. You know, there's Chinatown, international district where people kind of lived in community to feel safety. And so I, I, I and as this dialogue continues culturally, I'm not even sure where I stand in this whole conversation. And so here you come, you know, here you, here you come along. <laughs> you could get it right. You come you, up you in my a, show. <laughs> you write a play, an opera, a memoir, you're writing songs, like, oh my God, I feel like an underperformer. Okay, <laughs> so here you come along, <laughs> expressing your story and voice and all these different ways. I mean, how? I guess the question is for you is how, you know, how, how have you, what is your, what is your evolving voice been? And I, I don't know if you struggled because you had a grandma who didn't really say that much, you know, you have like other relatives that spoke, you know, ardently and, and publicly. So how, where do you fall on this spectrum? Hmm. Hmm. Well, you asked a lot of questions there. I'll tell you one of the things that one of the places I have fallen, um, because I was a scholarship girl and got the best educations America can give. Um, those educations that I got high school college, graduate school, were the educations that were meant to give advantage to white students. The the only reason you do that, um, I think it was either the Nation or the Atlantic in the last month that had a, a a cover story saying private schools are no longer defensible because their thesis was that these schools that are so good are meant to give advantage to the wealthy white students who go there Mm -hmm. to make sure that they will get things that other people will not. Mm -hmm. Like that's the reason you do it. Having had that education, now that education can teach me a lot about um, the success in white America. Mm -hmm. It, It cannot teach me about how to live a full human life Mm. as a black American Mm. they 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 had nothing for me for Mm -hmm. that 
Like mm -hmm. that wasn't that wasn't what they were about. That's not that's not what they were talking about. Right. So they they couldn't help me with that. They couldn't help me what what I learned, what they could tell me if I was willing to learn it was the the extent to which I could try to assimilate. Mm -hmm. The extent to which I could do um, cultural uh, black people pleasing. It's mm -hmm. the it's the cultural equivalent of individual people pleasing, mm -hmm. right? To have your nose pressed up against the glass saying, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try to be as much like you as possible. Will you please like me? Mm -hmm. You know, you and I were in the break, we're talking about hair, right? Mm -hmm. So that you say, oh, please, please, I'll, I'll do, I'll make my hair not look like wool. Will you, will you like me now? I'll get my nose fixed. I'll do, will you like me? Will you, please, I'll be. Um, so, so, but, so there's that at the same time, there is the fact that I am an American. Mm -hmm. I did study the violin. I did love to play it. I did love to learn from the man who was a Jew who escaped Germany mm -hmm. and was an old man with and a German accent, he would always tell me, no, you put that down and you would, <laughs> you do that. You're so, these children, you're so lazy, put that down. Like, I loved him <laughs> and I loved that he taught me. Like, I loved, I loved the specificity of the fingers. I was a perfector. So, but, but when is, when is only that? When, when is it true that you learn to do that and you also are supposed to believe there's a hierarchy so that that music is more important and better than the gospel music you sing in church? Yeah, when do you but, reject your own culture because right. you've assimilated so much to right. the other culture right. that you actually right. reject or haven't even explored your own culture as it, because you've spent most of your time assimilating. I mean, I can completely relate right. from the Asian, from my own experience um, being, you know, first generation Asian and having to assimilate. And, you know, the you're kind of in between these two worlds. The Chinese cultures are extremely different than the American cultures and, and culture and just trying to negotiate the two and not even, not even sure where I've landed. And I don't even know, does it make it, you know, I, I don't know, like I, I would say that I'm landed someplace in between these two spaces, you know, m modest and, humble and quiet and usually not speaking um truth to power like that's not that's not my asian way but yet at the same time i'm doing this radio show right <laughs> speaking oh yeah. yeah oh yeah yeah, yeah. so it's, it's it's a very so here you are you know here you are with i mean your stories are so powerful because they tell um at least a, 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 a multiple generations and your experience as as African Americans here in America, and now you have your daughters too. So you have all these kinds of um, experiences. How I mean, how have you learned to negotiate the two, or how, where do you come down on negotiating the two? Because you've been assimilated. I mean, I think both of us have assimilated to being white men. I mean, let's face it, when you go to like an Ivy League school or an MBA program or whatever esteemed programs that both of us went to and all the ways I've been cultivated, I'm basically a white man on the, you know, I, I actually have to spend a lot, I have spent probably the last eight to 10 years just trying no longer to be a white man because <laughs> that just sounds so yeah. ridiculous, but it's yeah, absolutely got, true. No, I got you. I got you. It's it's fascinating because, but yes, 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 and yeah. So for me, writing, um, it's figuring out how to use what I've learned to express 
what I, what I know or need to discover. Mm. So for me, it's also been a mechanism to learn. Writing is, is not just, I mean, writing is horrible when you, when you think you know so much that you're going to write something <clears throat> and tell the world. <laughs> Stanley Kunitz, wonderful poet, poet talked about um, talking about a poem being, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wreck, 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 wreck the phrase. But he talked about the form being a container to hold energy. Mm. And if the form is bad, if the poem is bad, the energy leaks out. Mm. Well, part of the energy that is <clears throat> communicated if the work is done beautifully and well, part of the energy that's communicated is what you have learned mm. while you were writing it, mm. right? So you, so you want to write something that holds that so the next person can open it. And when you open a book and you read something and you get to the end and you feel the tears spring, that means the energy is still in there. Mm. And you read it and you just start laughing out loud on the subways. <laughs> <laughs> and people look at you and you just point to the book and they all like that yeah. means the energy has been held mm, that's beautiful and for me that's that's I would waste this education if I did not figure out how to deepen my freedom to do the thing I was built to do I was built to write that's what I'm really built for. Now, these other things I've done in my life, I've had to, and it's a little bit of a, of a, of a black tax, but everybody's got some sort of a tax. Um, so for those reasons, I have also done a, a lot of civic engagement, right? For those reasons, I have, I started an organization and learned to do fundraising and did celebration of black writing and art sanctuary and brought you know, a, any, a, a black arts organization that served up to 15,000 people a year that did um, after school program that did like all of that stuff. Yes, I am an introvert. And yes, doing all that work blew my extrovert skill set up on steroids. <laughs> but at the same time, so that culturally, but I had to do that work because I'm a black woman, writing did this for me. So I use art and, and, and forms of art and learning and, and getting people to come perform it. And I use that to help my own community. At the same, similarly in a parallel effort, my personal work was to learn how to do family mm. that would not get blown apart by rage. Mm. Because part of the, the tax of all of this, all of this remembered and decontextualized and all these words, uh, rage and fear and trauma, one of the effects of it was that it was very difficult for the individuals in my family to um, feel safe with each other. Mm. Mm. And that's one of the things that I write about in Lady City. Mm -hmm. um, so I write about it, but I, you can't write about something you haven't learned. Um, my, my husband who wrote a novel about a woman coming into sort of spiritual awakening said at the end of it, well, I guess the fact is I, he went to seminary. He said, I don't need to be writing about spiritual awakening. I need to, I need to awaken. Hmm. Like that's what this book is telling me I need to do. Well, luckily um, what we had done was figure out how can I do intimacy? Hmm. How can I trust? Because the fact is, my grandmother did not do intimacy. That's why intimacy. That's why I did the memoir and was trying to understand it. That's why I did the mm. opera. And the question in the opera, 
because operas have to be very, very, very clear, very simple, very simple. The question in the opera was, did she love us? Hmm. Was, was it just, was it just nice? Were we all just being comfortable? But did she really love us hmm. or not? She who, um, who my father and she were like inseparable and then they had a seven year time where they didn't speak. Wow. Whoa, whoa, I thought you said you would do anything for, you know, I'd do anything for my mother. I'd die for my mother. But then for seven years, there's no speaking. Like what, what, how, how, what's happening? Right. Why was it that my mother and father could not stay together? Why was it that my grandmother had two unhappy marriages? Why was it that, you know, you have to sort of go back to that post-Civil War generation on both sides? It was back to great grandparents mm. that I had to go to see anybody who managed to stay married. Mm. Wow. So can I, can I do, so can I in my own life, can I figure out how to do intimacy? Mm. Mm. You know, and I said to Nana, you know, she would, sometimes she would bang on her wheelchair and say, why am I still alive? And, what if, <laughs> and I said to her, I said, Nana, maybe, maybe God has kept you alive so that you could have an intimate relationship with somebody who will tell you no? She didn't think that was funny. <laughs> <laughs> I would laugh. She she didn't think that was funny. Well, so what you learn through writing of this book about yourself is it sounds like is your family what you inherited mm -hmm. about it what intimacy was right. based on what your grandparents, you know, it's like a, a passed down yeah. kind of view of right. what intimacy um, was. And it's like, it sounds like this kind of like very loyal, mm -hmm. but then also kind of contained, like never mm -hmm. really kind of like going out there and really allowing someone to see like your vulnerable side. Heart. <laughs> your heart and so when you went through and examined um this legacy or in some ways beliefs that you inherited how did that shape how you lived your life differently or similarly By the time Nana came to live with us, I had already spent my adult life trying to learn these things. Mm. So, so that when she came, I was a little, sometimes you don't realize how far you've traveled until, mm. right? And then when she came in, I realized, whoa, well, we're living by different rules. Wow. Totally different rules. Yeah. yeah. We have this idea. Um, um, I've kind of got, I've had a similar journey, I think, um, mm -hmm. in that, um, and someone described it as cycle breakers. You know, you break the cycle mm -hmm. of what was there yeah. before and it could be a karmic cycle i don't even know what cycle it is but it's the cycle of beliefs and behaviors that continue the same thing over and over again and until someone says no you know i'm going to stop you know whatever this is you know so for my asian story it's like no emotions never any emotions just mm -hmm. dig them in a deep well and never have them come out again no affection like personal views you know it's like that's too much you know so it's like and it's like mm -hmm. nope I, i'm not doing i know <laughs> i know these are my cultural beliefs but i've chosen not 
to adopt these at all because I don't think they've worked. Like I've been punished um, in some ways. I've been harmed by these values and I don't want I, these values, behaviors, beliefs, and they have harmed me. And, and wow. going back to what you're saying and not living a full expression of your humanness, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. And so if I, if ultimately life is about experiencing our full humanity, then whenever you have anything that truncates or, or shapes a tree in a particular way, you know, you, you start missing all the limbs, like you can't grow because you've just been cultivated in some weird, you know, direction. Um, so um, how has this shaped your daughters and how you work with your daughters? Um, I, I'm still, I'm still back with you on the full humanity. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> if, because if life is about, the, I think, I think life is figuring out how to give and receive love. Mm. And I think that you, go, you try to develop that full humanity so that you can do that so that you can mm. give love fully. Mm. and receive it um, graciously, mm. like, like land taking rain mm. so it doesn't just wash off. Um, my daughters, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't usually talk about them very much in interviews because I feel like like I talk about my story, but there's less so because I don't always have permission and I don't know what I Oh no, as a mo like your mothering of your daughters. My mothering of my daughters. Is. Well, I will tell you that um, there is how you act to them. And what I have tried to do in our generation with them was make sure that I had stopped uh, the, the, the expression of addiction that had come through my family mm -hmm. in, in my generation. Mm -hmm. So they grew up in a house where there was no um, um, abuse of alcohol or addictive, mm -hmm. like, I wanted to make sure that I stopped that with me mm -hmm. and it was behavior and it is in the body and they, mm -hmm. so they, you, you, you don't talk to them about it, but they grow up in a house mm -hmm. where, you know, nobody uh, falls asleep at the dinner table, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or, or whatever. Um, I think that was useful when I will tell you, there are other things. And I just, the other day I was thinking, Oh my goodness. I wrote a book called The Price of a Child, which is a novel about a woman escaping from slavery. And I said to my husband, I've got to get this book out to the editor. I was pregnant. I was on bed rest. I'd had um, a false labor. I've got to get this book out of this house before I have this baby. Mm -hmm. I can't have the slavery and all that stuff right. in the house. But I did wake up in the middle of the night and I saw a foot that was turned in like a club foot and had read about how people 